This is five on your side at six, focused on you. Friends and family gathered in Columbia, Illinois for the funeral of a teenager. 15-year-old Crawford Bryant was a passenger in a car when it crashed over Labor Day weekend. Thank you for being with us. I'm Ann Allred. And I'm Mike Bush. Columbia High School canceled class today so students, staff, and family could attend his funeral. Holden Kerwicki has our report. Columbia, Illinois has a population of just under 11,000 people. And Thursday morning, seemingly all of them were packed into Order Park. Today is a celebration of life of Crawford Bryant, um, who was near and dear to everyone's heart in this community. 15-year-old Crawford Bryant was a standout on the soccer field, starring for Columbia High's varsity team as a sophomore. His team, whether it be for club or high school, was like another family for him. He was this gentle, soft-spoken, kind-hearted young man, and then he stepped on the field and suddenly became Superman. As tenacious as Crawford was on the field, friends and family alike say he was always smiling off the pitch. So as Crawford's career began to take off and his talent became noticeable, uh, we ran into a problem. And that's Crawford. Crawford had the most contagious laugh ever. It could be the most unfunny joke ever, but just hearing his laugh would make you crack up. While the community still struggles to wrap their mind around why the 15-year-old was taken from them so soon. How can this happen to someone so innocent, so sweet? How can something this terrible happen? Those who knew Crawford best say simply having him in their life was a blessing. I feel like he was a gift from God and, um, and even though we only had 15 years with him, God chose all of us to spend 15 years with this, this angel. Reporting in Columbia, Illinois, Holden Kerwicki, five on your side. And there's another celebration of Crawford Bryant's life tomorrow night when Columbia's football team takes on rival Waterloo, whose fans already agreed to wear orange and blue as a show of unity. Pro-choice advocates won a major court battle over the language that will appear on the Missouri ballot this November. Court struck down Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft's version, describing his ballot question as unfair, inaccurate, insufficient, and misleading in four separate categories. The court drafted new language defining the impact of a yes vote as something that would establish a constitutional right to make decisions about reproductive health care and remove Missouri's ban on abortion. You can read the full updated ballot language on our website. KSDK.com. New body cam video shows the events leading up to the tragic shooting death of Sonia Massey, a Sangamon County deputy shot and killed her in her own home on July 6th. The day before, her mother called 911 worried about Sonia's mental health. Springfield police officers responded to her aunt's house and found Sonia in the front yard. She told the officer she wanted to get her belongings and go home. In the video, the officers ask her if she wants to get medical help and she tells them no. There's only so much that we can do unless you want to want something else done, right? I don't know what to do, y'all. I'm from San Diego, and then I have nothing but my baby. I don't know what to do. I asked them for help, and they're not helping me. Sonia did receive medical attention that afternoon, just hours before Sangamon County deputies arrived at her house that final time on July 6th. The ex-deputy who shot her, Sean Grayson, is being held on several charges, including first-degree murder. Tonight, one less hurdle for nuclear weapons workers. Some much needed clarity was given today at an event meant to honor their hard work. That banquet hall was filled with different types of workers from construction to production. And they all had a common theme. Each worked at a contaminated site. Here's Justina Cornell. My dad was a chemical operator and my mom worked in the lab. Her parents motivated her passion and purpose. Denise Brock's parents worked at the Mellencrop plant in downtown St. Louis, which produced uranium for the development of the first atomic bomb. I believe like 1945, so it was before I was ever born. And um, I heard about this piece of legislation. Uh, it basically stated if you worked at one of these facilities, and they mentioned Mellencrop, and if you had cancer, you would be eligible for compensation. She claims the government denied her dad working there after dedicating 15 years, and so they fought. And we were able to prove that employment, and my mom was actually the first payment out here in Missouri. Her dedication doesn't end there. On Thursday, this room in St. Charles County honored nuclear weapons workers. Many have filed claims for federal compensation for potential exposure from work sites. One of those laborers, Bill Maxey. I wouldn't have walked on that job if, if I would have known what was out there. He worked at the Mellencrop plant and Weldon Spring site, a plant that processed uranium. There's a lot of people that work there that has a lot of health problems. And we have 
a lot of foremans that passed away, you know, from various cancers. His recent claim for compensation was denied. And when they file a claim and Social Security detailed earnings are filed, it's going to come back to their subcontractor. The problem is that all of those subcontractors were not listed in a database nor were the workers. That's where Brock steps in. She pressured the Department of Energy to dig deeper. Has actually found records, um, I believe they're mostly from Weldon Spring, that will actually list the names of workers and the subcontractors, as well as a list of about 5,000 employees that were known to be out there. She announced the game-changing decision on Thursday. Her speech talked about working to help the workers, always remembering her parents, the main focus in this fight. So long as there's a breath in my body, I'll continue to fight for these workers. Justina Cornell, five on your side. Now with these documents in the hands of the Department of Energy, these cases could be resolved soon. Every claim is case by case. However, if compensated, they could receive up to $400,000 with medical benefits. Right now, 30, 36 chihuahuas rescued in Franklin County are recovering at the Humane Society in St. Louis. Their owner has health problems, recently moved to a nursing home, and agreed to give up the animals. Members of the Animal Cruelty Task Force say the rescue is difficult because the dogs were roaming free on the property and are afraid of humans. They range in age and have various health problems. All will eventually be available for adoption. It can be a while for some of these, you know, before they're ready for adoption. As you can see, this little guy, you know, he does have some hair loss. There are some fleas, so it might take him a little while to fully recover. Once they're fully recovered, you know, they will be made available on our website. That website updates every hour on the hour. The Humane Society is looking for donations to make the dog's recovery more comfortable. Things like blankets, newspapers, dog toys, and dog beds. The Animal Protective Association of Missouri is also looking for help. St. Louis County Police responded to a home in Wildwood on August 28th for a welfare check and found 137 cats. They found them living in filthy conditions. It's unclear if any criminal charges will be filed. The group says the cats aren't yet ready to be adopted, so it's looking for people willing to adopt or foster other animals currently in their shelter. We've reported on the teacher shortage for years, but tonight we're talking to two school districts who have solved the shortage by taking their search overseas. Tracy Hinson learned about where these educators are coming from and their qualifications to teach in local schools. We had 188 applicants. Out of the 188, we were very selective. 21 educators made the cut. We had six different countries, and just so happened this year, we have two countries where all of our residents are from. They are from Ghana and the Philippines. With numerous positions to fill, St. Louis Public Schools partnered with a no-cost recruiting agency to hire into their teaching force. So our fifth and sixth grade, and mainly our middle school, science and math. But are the international educators qualified to teach in Missouri? Yes, they are credentialed. They have actually been teachers in their home country for a number of years. They come here to Missouri working with the U.S. Department of State, and we're helping them get reciprocity so they will have full certification in the state of Missouri. A process SLPS has already gone through. So just finishing out their credentials here in Missouri took about maybe a month, and we already have finished that process. The program is new for SLPS, but it's old hat for Riverview Gardens, so I talked to them about how it's going. They came in and they were instructionally strong and it went really well. They were able to support us in that area and we were able to support them in making the, the cultural connections and we had a great year. A great year that continues this year with a new group of international teachers. Tracy Hinson, five on your side. Tracy also checked in with the teachers union that represents SLPS. Their president, Ray Cummings, said they support the international teachers as it helps the burden of the educator shortage. A South St. Louis Italian restaurant is closing after 38 years in business. La Russo's Cucina first opened on Hampton Avenue back in 1986. It moved to Watson Road in 1989. According to our partners at the St. Louis Business Journal, owner Terry La Russo says the pandemic, the death of her husband Rich in 2022, and rising supply chain costs all weighed in her decision to close. The restaurant's last day will be September 29th.